I want to let Myra uh, open us up in prayer, and then she is going to share from Luke chapter 1, I believe, and we titled it A Handmaid's Tale. Thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the blessing of your son, Jesus. Thank you for all that's coming to pass in these days ahead for us, Father, and all you have done for us in the past, Father. We love you. We honor you. We thank you for each opportunity because we know that you are in it. In Jesus' name, we give you the glory and the praise. Amen. Amen. Um, I started uh, thinking about Mother's Day or Mary came up first. Either way, it's apropos for this time because I think next Sunday is, is Mother's Day in the States and Wednesday is celebrated in Guatemala. And years ago, uh, my pastor's wife, Dottie, did a teaching about God is looking for a Mary. And I had shared that, I think the other year or maybe two years ago. But God gave me another take on it today, even different from what <laughs> I had told Matt. Mm -hmm. But we know the story that uh, Mary was, you know, just living her life. We believe she was a humble young woman who loved the Lord and was devoted to him in prayer. And as I think Matt had told me at one time, he fell in love with me because he saw me going about my father's business. And I think that when I think of Mary, even though she lived in a, a, a village and her life was very simple, her heart was drawn to God. Why do I say that? Because the way she responded when the angel came to her and he called her blessed and you know chosen and and these titles that she's you know she went like I'm confused. You're talking about me? Because she did not realize who she was in the eyes of God. Because he, as the scripture says, that the eyes of the Lord is going about all the earth. It's in Second Chronicles um, 19, no, 16.9. That the eyes of the Lord is going up all across the earth, searching for those who will be loyal, but to bless them. And then she turns around and talks about how blessed she is. And even the angel said that to her. So we would talk about being blessed. I mean, she was and is blessed among women because as a Jewish believer, based on the Old Testament, they were looking for a Messiah. And how is this Messiah going to come? But through a virgin. And that's one of the definitions of a handmaiden because she said, I am a handmaiden. I am your handmaiden. I am your servant. Just tell me what you want. I will do that. I will do according to your word. I mean, she didn't go like, oh, no, not me. I'm not going to, I'm not doing it. She just said, okay, I'm your handmaiden. If this is what you want me to do, I will do this. Because her heart was open to the Lord to obey him and to hearken to his word, that whatever he would say. And that was the issue in Second Chronicles with this King Asa who had been blessed but didn't really have a relationship with the Lord because he had been in battles and God had gotten him out, but got to the point where it didn't look that good and he doubted and he tried other ways, but the ways that were not showing his faith in God to resolve the problem. And that's when the prophet came to him and said that. Because God is looking at our hearts, our loyalty to him, our desire to be perfect, because that's another word that says perfect. And he's a, you say perfect? Yeah, they say perfect. They translated it perfect in his heart. And it was interesting as I was reading about it, you know, it says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. So I, I was imagining Mary going about, and I said something about milking a cow. I don't know if she had a cow. She might have had a goat. <laughs> but going out, you know, getting a, picking out the, the eggs for the day and, and doing her daily choice, but <laughs> thinking about God thanking him as she's walking along, blessing him in her heart. And that's the purity that was in her heart because part of that definition is a virgin and pure. All that's part of being a handmaiden for God. 
because he had called her out to be the vessel that would carry the most precious gift any woman could ever carry, and that is Messiah, God with us, Emmanuel. And she had to be strong because one of the, the, the um, uh, translations said, for someone that he can be strong for, because after she accepted that, did everything go well for her? I'm sure that, you know, she was betrothed, but there was rumors that Joseph wasn't her father. There were a whole lot of different rumors that maybe she, one of the Romans she had got was one of the mm -hmm. Roman centurions or one of the Roman soldiers. So she began her mission to carry this child under suspicion and degradation and rumors and that she wasn't a good woman, not in the eyes of the public, that she might have been doing things that she shouldn't have. So she had to be strong in her heart with her relationship with the Lord. And plus, you know, even as, as the journey went on, when he's 12, year old, he's 12 years old, Jesus is 12, and he turns around, and when they finally find him, he says, I'm going, I'm doing my father's business. Don't, you know, why are you worried about me? So she was kind of put in her place. You know how a mother wants to like, what are you doing? What's going on? Let me know. We're worried about. But he let her know. You carried me, but I belong to God. So I have to do what I have to do. And as you know, as the journey went on, you know, she he she saw him going from place to place, and she joined in with the other women providing for him. She did what she had to do, knowing that when the couple of the scriptures says she hid all this in her heart because she knew what the end would be, even the glory of God that was going to be manifested, but also the struggle and the things her son would suffer in order to save the world, save her because she was there at the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit, she was in that upper room, read your acts, she was in the room. So not only did she bring forth her Savior, she received the Holy Spirit. She was a participant of this journey of knowing the true and living God through Jesus Christ. She truly was a handmaiden. She walked this journey in faith, not even knowing how she would make it, but knowing that God would get her through with the confidence and being loyal to him. Whatever he said to do, she would do it. And I, as I was reading it, um, I was drawn to another part of, of Luke where even when Jesus was casting out a demon and there was a crowd of people watching, a woman in the crowd said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. You've heard that if you're Catholic or not even Catholic, you heard that. Blessed is the woman that bore you and the breast which nurtured you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. So he rebuked his mother. In a way, this woman was saying, bless you. your mother, you know, she did, she bore you. And he said, no, the most important thing is, Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it because his loyalty is to God. I'm sure God appreciated this woman because he wouldn't have chosen her. But she was a vessel. She was a handmaiden. She did not have a crown on her head. She may have got one when she went to heaven. But she did not have walk around on earth with a crown on her head and being elevated above Jesus. She was a lowly handmaid. She even had a song in the book of Luke. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For who is mighty has done great things for me. And... Holy is his name. That was her expression of adoration for God. But 
his adoration and his love and sacrifice was us for us was for everyone who would accept the blessings are for all of us she is not the only blessed woman <laughs> we are not called out to be individually blessed we are all called out to be blessed overall and it's up to us to take that calling and respond to it that's the that's the that's the thing as a mother she didn't have to teach her son how to be holy he was already <laughs> holy but imagine the mothers of today they have a responsibility to be an example of a godly woman, which Mary was a very good example. Because she trusted the Lord. She walked through the valley she had to walk through. Knowing that she would lose her son in, in the flesh. But gain him in a heavenly and divine way. That she would never lose him because he didn't belong to her. He belonged to everyone. His desire was to save us all. And that separation probably was hard because as a mother, we were, this is my child. But she was strong for the task. God knew. And I think of like, uh, we talk about Job, like when, when the devil went to, went to the heavens and talked to God for Job. Imagine if he went to heaven and said, what about that Mary? You've been looking for someone to carry this, this Messiah. I think this Mary could do that <laughs> and God could say to him I know she could do that because I know her heart is perfect towards me he knew her heart he knew what she could deal with how she would be strong in her relationship with the Lord Jesus mm -hmm. Christ and that's why he chose Mary but we are all chosen for a calling to seek the Lord and to follow him and to obey him in all of our ways. And I'm going to end with this in 2 Chronicles uh, 3. It says, no, I'm sorry, 2 Chronicles 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. We all have that ability. When we take the veil off of our face, when we, as we were talking the other week, put that salve in our eyes so we can see clearly the glory of the Lord that is being transformed in us that we will reflect the same image of our Lord and Savior in our attitude, in our responses, in the way we mm. are like Mary, a handmaiden, one who is loyal to the Lord, loyal to the word, who understands that as a vessel, he can fill us with all that we need to reflect his glory on this earth. That's a call. And I praise God for, the, for Mary, for her humility, for her understanding that, she, true, she was blessed. But at first she said, are you talking to me? <laughs> but she realized the blessing God had given her. And they were all blessed. She wasn't like lording it over everyone else. She knew the blessing that God was giving her. And we should recognize that if we are walking in the same spirit of being maidens or servants for the Most High God, we have that blessing. And we can use that blessing and bless others as we serve them through the Word of God. Serve our children. Teach them about God. Be an example for them. Walk in the way that shows forth the humility of God and the glory of God. I think about my mom and the first thing I think about is a lady. My mother was a lady. She dressed in a way that my sisters and well, my other sisters would take her clothes and wear them because it was so nice. She kept her things so good. 
but she was very particular about the way she carried herself. I never heard a curse word come out of my mouth. If she ever did, I would have been shocked. I would have been shocked. She was quiet. I mean, she had her strength, but she was a quiet woman who, when she says something, you listen, but she never raised her voice. She was a lady, and she walked that way, and she taught us, and it was up to us, her daughters, to follow her example. But she did her part. And as women, we need to do our part with our children, with our spouses, whatever position God has placed us with. I see Nancy out there with our ministry, <laughs> being walking in the things of God, walking in the light of who he is, being transformed every day that whoever we come in contact with, they will know how blessed we are and sense that we don't want to hold that blessing inward, but we want to bless others so that the glory of God will be evident in their lives. They will be drawn to him. They will want to know more about him. That's the blessing of knowing God, of being humble before him and saying, here I am, Lord. Do whatever you want to do according to your word. <clears throat> I follow you all the days of my life. Amen. 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 Some of the um, attitudes and ways that Mary is perceived. Um, I've, I'm a little hesitant because there's been so much over glorification in who she is. But at the same time, we do want to acknowledge that it had to be a special woman who would be the vessel that would bring in our Lord and Savior. So we don't want to take anything away either. Um, so when I started to do the research and the homework, um, oh my gosh, I found so much stuff. I'm going to try to do it and actually maybe today actually be calm about it um, because there's a lot of details that we need to flesh out. So um, we're going to get to Mary, but we cannot deal with anything related to the visitation that she had from the angel Gabriel until we go back to another couple. And that would be Zacharias and Elizabeth. And when I started reading Luke 1, the first thing that popped into my head, this is not only the handmaid's tale, but this is also a tale of two births. And 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 it matters. And I'm hopefully I can flesh this out. I mean, like I haven't written anything down per se. I, I put some notes in my Bible that I'm looking at just to make sure that I stay on course. And since uh, my man Lee Whitaker, Pastor Lee Whitaker just popped in, I've got to be, be really accurate now or he might call me out. <laughs> but to understand and appreciate Mary as the handmaid or handmaiden, we need to understand the awesomeness of God and how he orchestrates everything. So when we are right at the beginning of Luke chapter one, it is significant that we have to flesh out a few verses with before we even get to Mary's tale because it's going to make what happened to Mary even more incredible and in how we view how God can use someone for his holy purposes. So I'm going to just kind of go in and out of Luke 1 with a, a few uh, passages that I highlighted right here because I wanted to make sure I didn't miss anything. So the first passage we're going to go to is, Luke, is in Luke 1 verse 5. It says, there was in the days of Herod, 
the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. So, guys, I could just really, I could expound on this verse for about 30 minutes, but I'm going to try to cut it to just a minute. Understand this, that we're already getting a picture of what's to come because these were in the days of Herod. Now, those Bible scholars know that it would also be through the kingship of the Herods that a hit would be placed on the firstborn male seed. And so we already have an atmosphere that even when something good is getting ready to happen, that evil is always present. I mean, I just it just popped out on the page the minute I looked at that. But then there's another special encounter because we have Zacharias, who is himself a priest, and he's wedded to Elizabeth, who just happens to be of the lineage of Aaron, the Levitical uh uh, lineage so that her genealogy also represents the priesthood. And you'll see as you continue to read on that both Zechariah and Elizabeth were found to be, the Bible says blameless, but they, 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 they were righteous and, and for the purposes of language, good role models for what is to come. So let me go to verse seven. I'm still in Luke one because I'm going to tie verse five and verse seven because it says, and they had no child because that Elizabeth was barren and they both were now well stricken in years. I love the King James because it goes into well stricken, but they's old. <laughs> okay. And so the first thing that I, I thought about was Abraham and Sarah, because here we have in the new covenant, kind of a mirror image of a couple that was in the old covenant by the name of Abraham and Sarah. And she too was barren and eventually would give child. And we're going to see that the same thing is going to happen here. Both cases, the couples were well in years. Now, we don't know how old um, Zechariah and Elizabeth was, but we know the ages of Abraham and Sarah because it was important uh, by God's standards that we knew their ages. But trust me, it had to be a situation where too old in the normal way of thinking, to even be considering having a child. Kind of reminds me of my situation right here because I can tell you, I don't think I'm letting out any of the family secrets. If Myra could get pregnant tomorrow, she would want to be pregnant. She would want to have that baby. And after that baby uh, left infancy, infancy, then she'd be ready to toss them off. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, 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 we we are here as a couple that unless the Lord <laughs> truly intervenes, we will not be having any children. So this is important, though, as we continue on, because it is laying the foundation for Mary. So let me continue. Um, there's some other things that we can do some comparative shopping, so to speak. We know already because Myra has shared this that Mary had a visitation mm -hmm. from the angel, the angel Gabriel. Uh, but we don't talk about how Elizabeth also had a visitation from that same angel. And it would have to be Gabriel, just give me all a little background Bible stuff, because Gabriel, in his function as one of the chief angels, 
in the heavenlies of heavenly, uh, was the one who was not only a messenger of God, but also was the one that gave messages to pronounce God's will. And, and that is very, very important because both of these women would have that encounter according to God's will. And we'll see that they will also have other experiences that are very similar. So anyway, in Luke 1 chapter, excuse me, Luke 1 verse 13, it then says, but the angel said unto him, and this is talking about Zechariah because Zechariah <laughs> wasn't used to having a direct uh, intervention with the angel. And like all of us, the first thing we think is, I must be in trouble. <laughs> so Zechariah is concerned and even more concerned because remember, he's a priest. But in 13, it says, but the angel said unto him, Zechariah, fear not, Zechariah, for thy prayer is heard and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son. And thou shalt call his name John. Now we know that this would end up being John the Baptist. Hope I'm doing okay, Lee Whitaker, if you're still out there, because I want to make sure I hit this right. Um, so, you know me and, and the way I study, what does John mean? What, what does the name mean? And it, it comes up with God's grace. Wow. Uh, in the Greek, uh, his name is pronounced Yohanan. And so we already have the setup for Mary. I, I promise you, I'm getting to Mary. But we already have it through Elizabeth and this pregnancy by God's grace. Then in verse 15, it says about John, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And, and this is key, he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Now, again, I know that you guys don't get all excited about this stuff, but I do because this is one of the first instances in the new covenant. Here's the thing. It says that John was filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit, we know, is God, and we know that the Holy Spirit has been around, of course, as long as God has been, and that's forever, whatever that means by God's uh, calendar. But what's really important to understand, didn't say that the Holy Spirit was upon John. It didn't say that the Holy Spirit was aiding John said he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is significant because we normally go to Acts chapter two for mankind to be filled with the Holy Spirit. But we're gonna see, I think about three instances right here in Luke one where the Holy Spirit is filling someone. And John, baby John, was the first one. So then it says that he is going to turn many in Israel towards the Lord. And we know this is true because we know that he's the voice crying out from the wilderness. And what is the word that he's crying out? Repent, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. We know this. And so we're 
before any of that has taken place, we're being set up. So if you think Elizabeth is being set up, wait until we read about how Mary is being set up. So let me kind of speed along here. So I'm going to jump down um, because Zechariah, upon receiving all this news from Gabriel, he was just like uh, Abraham. He doubted. He 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 couldn't he couldn't grasp it, and because he couldn't grasp it, we'll find that his mouth would be shut by the angel for a period of time until all the things that Gabriel had shared would be manifest. And that is important too, because there is a blessed quietness in what's taking place because we're going to see that Zechariah was shut up by removing his vocal ability. We're going to see in a few minutes that Elizabeth as well would have something incredible happen to her and she would be quiet about it. And it's all for a reason. This is what we call a setup. I'm setting you guys up. All right. So then it says in verse 19, and the angel answering said unto him, I am Gabriel that stand in the presence of God. And am sent to speak unto thee and to show thee glad tidings. And this is good news. Even though uh, Zechariah could not believe it, but good news was received in his household. So now in verse 24, like I said, I'm just jumping through. You guys read it all for yourself. Luke. One is so incredible. If you take the time to really slow down and read it and meditate and marinate on this stuff, but I'm speeding through. So in verse 24, it says, and after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein he looked on me to take away my reproach among men. I had never, ever really considered this, but in understanding not only Jewish culture, but even culture today um, to a certain extent, but definitely in Jewish culture, for a woman to be barren, was an embarrassment. And it was an embarrassment because it actually affected one's social status in the community. It also represented that a lineage would not be extended. So this was really important to Elizabeth. And I'm going to just make a declaration in that one of the reasons why she hid away and told no one about what was going on was number one, I believe, and again, this is just me now, I believe that she wanted to hold on to that moment and just celebrate that moment and worship with herself, without any of the community and, you know, all of those uh, people that uh, doubted interfering in her joy. Now, that's one thing. But also, I believe that the Holy Spirit had something to do with this as well, because her announcement could somehow reduce the excitement for another birth that is to come, as my wife has already shared from this precious handmaiden of the Lord that we're getting ready to read about. So that's my setup. Now, 
let's talk about Mary. And so we know that number one, she was a virgin. We know that she was uh, betrothed to Joseph. Now, here's where it gets really cool because in each of their lineage, they are both connected to the tribe of Judah. And that is significant because out of that tribe comes the connector, the one common element in their lineages. And we could do a, a deep dive study on how they get to this place. When I did my little homework, they would tell you that Joseph and Mary were distant cousins, but no matter what, the lineage had to come through the kingship of David. Because out of that tribe, out of that kingdom would come the true and last and final king that we would ever need. And so God is setting us up. So Mary has a relative by the name of Elizabeth who represents the Levitical tribe so that you have a priesthood there. And then you have Mary and Joseph on the other side from the David's, from David's lineage, and they represent kingdom. So what do we have? King of kings, Lord of lords, and the greatest of high priests getting ready to manifest itself in this child that we now call Jesus or Yeshua. And does that get you excited? I, I mean, so I, I tell you, I, I, I've been trying to connect all these dots. So bear with me because I'm, I'm getting close to, to my clothes, believe it or not. Um, but this is key, and I'm going to spend a little time here. In verse 26, it says, And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth. When I did my study, guys, it blew my mind. Everything, I'm telling you, everything consistently points to God being so real that I, anyone who thinks that they're agnostic or an atheist or a pagan, they have no understanding of how the dots of this Bible that many have said is just a bunch of stories, many have said has no relevance, many have said means nothing in today's society, how everything matters. And so I, I looked at that six month, and for me, six automatically, that's the number of man for you guys that are into uh, biblical numbers that, that represents man. But in Jewish culture, it actually represents the month of Elul. I, I hope I'm spelling, uh, pronouncing this correctly. Elul. Elul. E-L-U-L. -L. Now, I want to read this because, man, this is incredible. It says, Elul is the 12th month, the 12th and final month in the Jewish calendar. Ah, but the sixth month counting from the month that's called Nisan. It is a month that connects the past with the coming year. Now, I'm going to tell you why that excites me. Because we know that John the Baptist would be birthed through Elizabeth. He represented a baptism or a past that spoke of repentance. And so he is the, the defining prophet of the old covenant. 
And all he could do was baptize unto repentance. That was the limitation that he had. As, as great of a prophet as he was, and scripture uh, bears this out, that he was the favorite prophet of Jesus himself. But John the Baptist could only go but so far. So it says it is a month that connects the past with the coming year. So we have the past represented in Elizabeth's belly, and we have the new year, new beginnings, if I can call that, in Jesus, who we will find will be a birth through Mary. It says, it is the time to reflect on where we stand, repentance, and where we should be going, salvation. Now, that was enough for me, but then I did a deeper dive, and it says this, during the month of Elul, the Jews blow the shofar. And you know, the shofar is the ram's, uh, the ram's horn that is used as a declaration, as an announcement or pronouncement of great things to come. So it says that during the month of Elul, the Jews blow the shofar and meditate on, uh, it says special psalms, but when I looked up the special psalms, it went to Psalm 27. So I don't have time to read all of that, um, but you guys read it because you will see that this all lines up with Mary. And so they meditate on Psalm 27 and anticipate the high holidays. And there are two high holidays in Jewish culture. The first one being Yom Kippur. And guess what Yom Kippur represents? Atonement, John the Baptist. But then the second high holiday is Rosh Hashanah. And that represents new beginning, Jesus. Man, I was like, I could just stay right here. Who cares about Mary right now? Because this was just blowing my mind. But again, guys, when we're doing a Bible study or meditating, it's so important just to do the deep dives. That's why I say don't move too fast in these scriptures. If you just read through this stuff, you're just reading through it and have no understanding of the power that's here. So, I mean, this is prophetic stuff I just read to you. Now, again, for those of you all that don't know about Jewish culture, both of those high holidays happen around the month of September. I think for uh, one, it's like the 14th and 15th, the other the 24th, 25th, but in the month of September. So this still gives us even more insight into where this birth of Jesus actually took place. I'm not going to get into that now because uh, that's taken off the focus of this lesson. But again, this is what makes all of this stuff exciting. All right. So in reading further, we know what happens. You know, Mary is visited by the same angel, Gabriel, and Gabriel informs her that she is going to be impregnated, not by sexual encounter, but by way of the Holy Spirit. So we have another instance of the Holy Spirit being in someone. Okay, so this is, this is important stuff. So as Gabriel is sharing in verses 32 and 33, it says, he shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. In other words, it gets no higher 
than this one to come. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. So again, confirmation coming through the lineage of David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, guys, if, you, if you've listened to previous things that I've shared, when I told you that Jesus, in fact, is the kingdom of God, his kingdom, he shall reign over his kingdom because he is the kingdom. There shall be no end. And I, I just did it, you know, because whenever the Bible is using certain references, in this case, the house of Jacob didn't go to Abraham, didn't go to Isaac, the house of Jacob. And that's because in the house of Jacob, that was a, a representation of God's covenant for his people, Israel. And in fact, wouldn't it be Jacob who would then be named Israel? Mm -hmm. See, all of these things are connecting. And this is what gets really, really exciting to me. So real quick, because I'm almost there to, to this Mary thing. All right. So anyway, Mary um, said to the angel, how can any of this happen when I've never been with a man? I'm just paraphrasing here. She's, she is true to the call. And, and like Myra shared, this is a woman who took her worship seriously. And I also, in conversation with Myra, I said, you know, there are a lot of women that could have been in line for this beautiful privilege. But, I mean, you could even say Elizabeth could have, until you understand, it had to come from the line of David. Right. And in that line, it had to be that Mary was the one most qualified. So I'm sorry for my Catholics and for those who are into Mary worship. It wasn't just the fact that she was found to be favorable in God's sight. She just happened to be from the right line, the right family to take on this holy, holy gift by God's standards. And so I want to just put a mark right here. Just simply, we cannot fall for any religiosity that is glorifying any human being, pure human being. That is a fallacy. We can definitely appreciate the fact that, wow, God used her. And as Myra shared, she would be declared blessed among women. But like Myra also shared, there were many that could have been counted blessed among women for their righteousness and for their dedication to the Most High God. Mary was the vessel that was best used for this purpose because not only was she a virgin, but she was to be married to a man who also comes out of that line of David. Don't you see? It wasn't the fact that just, you know, that Joseph was a carpenter. It's his lineage. The lineage matters. The lineage of Elizabeth matters since Elizabeth and Mary were cousins. And even that has a special thing going on. And I'm going to share it because this shows that Mary truly indeed was special in God's eyes. And I will also say, just kind of giving y'all just a little teaser that we're going to see that Mary was able to know something that no one else knew other than the fact that she was being impregnated with uh, Jesus Christ. So anyway, the angel in uh, verse 35, it says, And the angel answered and said unto her, 
the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. Now at this point, the Holy Ghost is upon her and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Now this is significant because <laughs> oh gosh, I can't even put it together without just getting excited <laughs> that <laughs> okay let me let me read uh let me read verse thirty nine and then I'm gonna connect the dots and Mary arose in those days and went into the hill uh country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zechariah and saluted. Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out loud, she spake out with a loud voice and said, Now, blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Okay, incredible stuff here. Remember, John the Baptist was already filled with the Holy Spirit per Gabriel. And when John the Baptist encountered the pregnant Mary, the Holy Spirit inside of him leapt in her belly. But it also said that she, Elizabeth, was then filled with the Holy with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. And this is important because it signifies who is to come. This is the announcement. And guys, how can I relate this to today? Now Myra set us up and said, you know, she was thinking about Mother's Day. And um Nothing wrong with celebrating <laughs> mothers, okay? But what I want you all to understand is if you're going to celebrate mothers, then we should celebrate the real quality that makes them special mothers indeed. These would be mothers who are filled with God's presence, and yes, they should be honored. And we, just like that baby in Elizabeth's belly, we should leap for joy that God has blessed our mothers in that way. Any other thing outside of holiness, and it's just a, a pagan holiday. But if you want to look at it the way that I have chosen to look at it, if you have a mother who fulfills the lifestyles of Elizabeth and Mary, filled with praise for God, available servants, priestly women, then, oh my gosh, celebrate to the glory of God and let the nations know that she's blessed. Don't make any mother or don't make Mary the mother of, of Jesus Christ. Do not make them a God. Do not make them a deity. They are not deities, but they are worthy and praiseworthy to be honored for the sacrifice of giving birth to you and the nurturing of making sure that we as children are fully equipped to be able to also fulfill 
the mission that God has given us to go ye therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever God has commanded us. So as I'm truly wrapping up, um, you know, we have a sector of society that takes what Elizabeth has pronounced to Mary and made a whole religion out of it where a woman is being glorified more than the Christ. And that is dangerous turf. Sorry if I'm offending, but this is just the, the truth. It is Jesus that we celebrate, the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who saves. He is the one. We know that Mary is special. We knew that Mary was special uh, when Jesus was an adult and the first miracle that was recorded was put forth when, uh, you know, he ended up turning water into wine. Mary had the insight because she was pushing him in order to do what he could do as God himself. And it was Jesus that had to say, woman, it's not my time yet. But that doesn't mean she did not know. You, you got to... You got to read this stuff and, 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 and really hear what God is saying to us. So, yes, the thing is, though, that gift is not just for Mary. Myra here can be filled with that same Holy Spirit to make pronunciations on things that are of God. You who are listening can also have that as well. But let's not deify anyone because that is dangerous territory and that is a gospel that is anti-Christ and we don't want to go there. We want to make sure that we put things in proper order. And so as I wrap this thing up, it then says in verse 45, and blessed is she that believed for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. The performance is that she would go through hardships. Mm -hmm. She would go through ridicule because unlike Elizabeth, it wasn't as easy for her to hide away. <laughs> and we know in the account that the Bible gives us that poor Joseph, he's on the outside looking in and he's a righteous man. He's a good man, guys. But he had no idea when this pronouncement was made that she was with child. Of course, the first thing that he did was think, oh my gosh, she's cheated on me. And Gabriel had to come right back to him and let him know that it's all right for the child that's in her was birthed in her by way of the Holy Spirit. And this is God's child because he was ready to put her away privately in divorce, but he didn't want her to be embarrassed. So that even speaks to his heart. Again, lineage guys, Joseph, Mary, House of David, Elizabeth, house of Levi, priesthood, kingship. It all combines into this glorious birth of Jesus Christ. Look, this should be the Christmas message, but, but look, suffice it to say that we can read this and we can appreciate Mary for who she is. She was a handmaiden, which is a servant, but a handmaiden in biblical definition, a handmaiden of God. She was totally dedicated to God. Probably the thing that made her attractive to Joseph in the same manner that I was attracted to Myra. Now, don't take this the wrong way. 
It wasn't her stunningly good looks. It wasn't her fabulous figure. I saw a woman that was about her father's business. And I thought for the first time, I said, oh my God, is this woman for me? <laughs> um, it, you know, but I knew that she had all the attributes like I wouldn't have to go and teach her the basics. Okay. So no trying to convert her to the gospel, no heavy lifting. She readily accepts her role in our marriage as wife and we operate in the order of God, man, woman, children. And because of that, it's a perfect situation. And so mothers are to be in that same manner. The reason why she was blessed among women is not just because of carrying the Christ, but she would prove it time and time again throughout his earthly ministry that she was right there in the cut. She was right there on the front line with him. And she was part of that group of women that knew about the resurrected Christ before the men could get with the program. So that is a blessing. And we should not devalue women just because they're women. But we also should not glorify anyone, anyone, any human being, because that is an offense to the most high God.